My name is Sephora Katz, formerly Fuchs. I was born in Simiatic, two hours by train from Warsaw, Poland, in 1938. As you know, many women don't like to divulge their age, but I am very proud to do so. The fact that I can be with you to share my tragic survival is a miracle, but very factual. First, I wish to welcome everyone here with the word Shalom. By the way, you will have a chance to learn a little foreign language today, Hebrew as well. Shalom in Hebrew has multiple meanings. Hello, goodbye, complete from the word Shalem, but most importantly, peace. I wish that there will be peace in everyone's heart, in everyone's home, and in the whole world. If there was peace in 1942, I would have had no information now to share with you. Shalom is the hope of all humanity, especially with the ongoing genocide in Darfur and other parts of the world, we cannot emphasize that enough. Hope can defeat despair, and with hope, we can think, walk, and dream ahead. The main reason I will share my survival with you is to make sure that no one ever says that the Holocaust never happened, and to educate everyone how to remember the past as well as all the good deeds done by the righteous one, and how to act and prevent future discrimination, hatred, and bigotry, and the suffering it causes, regardless of one's race, religion, or sexual orientation in all ages. In order to teach, I must reach out to you and emphasize that the art of caring is an essential gift for everyone to maintain one's dignity, identity, and of course, hope. I feel compelled to divulge to one of you or to a thousand. For me, as painful as it is, it is a crime not to speak out. By sharing my past with you, I am not trying to strain you emotionally, but stimulate and inspire you to take a stand for justice and human rights. I believe deep in my heart that even one individual can make a difference by taking such a stand. Our Jewish early laws, the Talmud, indicates that one who saves one life is regarded as though one saved a whole world. Therefore, the world must know 
that when we say in Hebrew the word dayenu, meaning enough, or le'olam lo ot pam, never again, we mean it in order to prevent future holocaust to Jews and non-Jews alike. On a snowy morning, November 1942, my uncle Benjamin Feldman entered his home in Simiatic, in the ghetto that we lived already for eight months, and instructed his wife, my Aunt Libby, to dress their four young children ages 8, 10, 12, and 14 in warm clothes and immediately assemble the rest of the immediate family living close by in the ghetto to his house. He heard from Jewish leaders in the ghetto that the situation is becoming very grave and in order to try and save ourselves, we must run away. After my father, Benjamin Fuchs, age 32, my mother, Shifra Terdi, my grandfather and two aunts living with us, and me, Zipora, at the tender age of four, arrived to his house, he told us that we must escape right away. He gave each one of us a package of sugar cubes and told us, in time of hunger, if you take and it melts, it could sustain you for a short time. My mother refused to leave as she was expecting my older sister, Bluma, age seven, to return from, from a nearby village in the same ghetto. But she said she knew the area of the forest and she'll follow us. My grandfather, being very religious, had to go to the synagogue to say a prayer after his deceased mother, so he did not want to leave. And my two aunts decided that they will remain in the ghetto with the friends because they didn't know what their destiny, their goral, will be. My mother wrapped me in a blanket, which you'll see later on, hugged and kissed me, and handed me to my father. This was the last time I saw my mother. My father carried me through a hole cut by my uncle in the fence that surrounded the ghetto. We all ran with my uncle and, and their four children. My uncle was very well acquainted with the area. As you see, I, at this young age, already became the enemy of the Third Reich. Why else would I have to run away to save my life? We heard gunshot in the distance, but miraculously nobody was hit. After sundown, my uncle made his way toward the house of a Polish acquaintance that used to deliver milk during better years to their summer house. When he arrived asking for help, 
they gave him a loaf of bread, but asked him to move on quickly. Because in that year, 1942, an order was, giving, was given, aiding and abating Jews was punishable by death. In the forest, we encountered other families that told my uncle that the only way he would survive if he is alone with no responsibility. But my uncle immediately decided that he would survive with his family or not at all. After enduring the physical and emotional burden of trekking through the deep woods, my uncle on the second day began his search for a temporary place to rest our party of eight. He covered us with leaves deeper by the tree. Peering in the distance, he saw a light. He decided to proceed alone toward the light. He had a premonition because he was religious that that was a signal from God for him to follow and get help for the family. He proceeded toward the light and arrived in a farmhouse. Looking in the window, he saw a woman sitting and weaving yarn. He knocked on the window. The woman stood up and crossed herself out of fear. But she opened the window and my uncle told her of the predicament that we are all in. So she asked my uncle to walk into the house and called her husband into the room, who my uncle recognized immediately as Dr. Luchinsky a Polish veterinarian who was indebted to my uncle for a past favor during the Russian occupation. At that time, my uncle was a manager in a flour mill, and that same Dr. Luchinsky came begging for flour to make bread for his own family. Isn't it ironic how things work? Dr. Luchinsky remembered the good deed and requested for my uncle, when it gets dark, to bring the rest of the family to the farmhouse. I must emphasize that being the Dr. Luchinsky was the veterinarian and treated the horses and dogs and animals of the German and Polish police, he knew when they are making rounds. So he guided my uncle when to take a chance and come. We arrived when it was dark. Doctor and Mrs. Luchinsky told their children that it is their responsibility as well to help and never divulge to anyone for their own safety. Dr. and Luchinsky and his wife, Anna, placed us in the potato silo, a hole below ground. 
And by the way, later on, you will have a chance to see a picture of the opening to the silo. This hall was camouflaged with woods, branches, and leaves. It was the only way we could be hidden, unobserved from ground level or above from air. The silo was so small that because of my four-year-old size, I was the only one that could stand up. Everybody else had to be underneath. We were ridden with fear. If we moved and made noise, we would be spotted. It was dark in the silo. We only saw a ray of sun or snowflakes through the branches. There was barely enough room to sleep, so we laid next to each other like sardines in a can. Did you ever look at a can of sardines, anyone? Well, those that didn't, as I mentioned to you, other students, in your science class, open up a can and see what it looks. And by the way, sardines in olive oil is very healthy. It's good for your heart. <laughs> so it has another purpose. My father told me over and over again not to cry for fear of being hurt. Can you imagine a powerful message to remember for a four-year-old and above all to follow the instructions? I learned that it is too dangerous to cry even as a child who is hungry thirsty, in pain, or afraid. In the silo, we only held hands, prayed in Hebrew and Yiddish, and counted each day of our survival. No one can imagine how at this young age, I was able to cope day after day, there were no games to play, no bedtime stories. I longed for my mother to hug me, but she was not there, and my father was too sick. He held me tight and covered me with my blanket, my friend. It was a miracle that we didn't all go insane. We attribute this to the help from God, our prayers, and the stamina of my uncle, a man with an iron will. In Hebrew, we call it a gibor, that kept our minds occupied and kept building up our hope for survival. Mrs. Luchinsky and Uncle Ben cooperated in feeding the family. She prepared a pot of boiled potatoes and tin soup like bouillon and left it hidden by the farmhouse which is close to the silo. My uncle late at night came out of the silo, picked up the two pots, brought it back, and divided in very small portions 
because it had to be kept for many days. My father refused the soup. He kept strict kosher laws. Even though in Hebrew there is a saying, pikuach nefesh doche akol, meaning that in order to save one's life, it postpones all the laws. Month went by of hunger, deprivation, and lack of sanitation, never bathing and never changing clothes. We were ridden with lice and came down with respiratory diseases. We began to regret leaving the ghetto and questioned the fate of the rest of the family that never came with us. Our so-called toilet was a metal pot, like a helmet that soldiers will wear in type, time of war. And we used it for our bodily functions. Again, late at night, when it was dark, Uncle Ben crawled out with that path, went deeper into the woods, dug an opening, poured the body waste and covered the opening. Tell me, when he was so afraid, why didn't he just throw it between the trees and run back to the silo. Anyone? Yes, young man. I'm sorry, I can't. If perhaps the Nazis were to find it, they would just start searching the area. What's your name? Ben. Ben, ben you get an A plus for me. <laughs> I am telling you. That is exactly because if the German soldiers or Polish soldiers would come by the area with dogs, the dog could also smell. And right away, like Ben said, they'll start thinking that somebody is hiding. I'm very proud of your answer. I hear after being in the silo, Uncle Ben suffered a severe illness, rendering him incapable of swallowing even a teaspoon of water. Dr. Luchinsky again showed his dedication to help Uncle Ben with his medical knowledge. Late in the evening, he and his son took Uncle Ben to the farmhouse to treat him. It took 10 days back and forth for Uncle Ben to get better. During the 10 days, my father prayed and said, Dear Lord, if you have to take one of us, take me and not Uncle Ben, the leader of the group. Because if he dies, for sure, the rest will die as well. About two weeks later, my father died. He laid with us unburied in the silo for seven days because the ground in the forest was frozen and nobody could dig an opening. So, Dr. Luchinsky and his older son 
boiled water, and late at night came to the area and poured to soften the ground. During these seven days, since it was dark in the silo, I didn't know that my father died. I thought that he was just so sick he couldn't answer me, and my family didn't want to tell it to me. So I cuddled up next to him and covered him and me with my blanket and prayed to God to help us to get well. And being it was dark, I couldn't see the color of his skin. And everyone's skin was cold because of the weather. So I didn't know. After seven days, when the ground got softer, Uncle Ben and Dr. Luchinsky took out my father and buried him deep in the forest by the tree they prepared and covered it. My uncle made a sign and vowed, if we survive, he will come back to this area, reclaim my father's remains, take him back to our town, Simiatic, and rebury him under strict Jewish laws. After 22 months and three days, scarcely clinging to life, we were liberated by the Russian soldiers in 1944. We were all ill and swollen from starvation, especially me and my Aunt Libby. No one can imagine the feeling coming out of the silo, taking a breath of fresh air and seeing as difficult as we were a little light after almost two years of darkness. We were lifted into the Russian truck since we could not walk. I vividly recall holding on to a pitcher of water that the Russians gave me, being afraid that a single drop of water will spill, and again, I'll have nothing to drink for the rest of my life. The soldiers proceeded toward the Russian border, at which time Uncle Ben made a quick decision to return to Simiatric. They took us off, they gave us some money and wished us good luck. In the area, Uncle Ben saw a Polish acquaintance with a horse and wagon and persuaded him to drive us back to our home. Uncle Ben gave him some of the money the Russian gave us as an appreciation for driving us back. Upon our return, our homes were occupied by Polish families, and being weak and afraid, we couldn't reclaim our properties. We learned sadly from Polish people that knew our families that my mother, sister, grandfather, 
aunts and uncles and cousins were all taken to Treblinka and guessed at the time when we were in the silo. Now I am a six-year-old orphan. My heart ached. I felt that I did not possess enough tears in my eyes as I cried for everyone. I felt that I did not deserve to be punished. I had not misbehaved. And I had my blanket, my treasure, and my link to my past to comfort me. With the help of the Jewish agency, the Sochnut, we settled in back in Simiatich and became healthier and stronger. And what do you think the first thing my uncle did when he became stronger? Anyone? Yes, young man. Very good. What's your name? Elvin. Elvin? Kelvin? Oh, thank you. You also get an A+. Plus. Thank you. You are... I must tell you, you are excellent listeners. So my uncle and his older son Shlomo, as Kelvin said, with a horse and wagon, went back to the area by the potato silo. My uncle found the sign by the tree, reclaimed my father's remains, and brought him back to the Jewish cemetery and reburied him under strict Jewish laws. By the way, that area is not in existence. It was destroyed. After being in Simiatic for six months, uh, my aunt and two boy cousins and me left for Romania. My uncle and two girl cousins went to Italy. And from there, we came to Israel, at that time, Palestine. We settled in, in a kibbutz in the beginning, and later on, in the town, Petach Tikva, which is the gate of hope. As you can see, my survival is full of hope. I spent in Israel 10 years. During the 10 years, my uncle, my great uncle in United States, Mr. Herman Bush, found out that I survived came to see me in Israel and brought me to the United States in 1955. It took him seven years to obtain a visa for me. I finished my last two years of high school at Van Steuben High School in Chicago. And what did you, what do you think I decided to do after high school? Anyone? Yes. Talk about your experience. That's very good, young man. That's one. But what did I want to, maybe I didn't ask the right question. What do you think I went to study? Yes. What? <laughs> what did he say? Yes, I did go, but what subject 
that's okay. What did I, anyone? Well, since I still have quite a bit to share with the young generation, I'll give you the answer. I decided to go into nursing. I entered Cook County School of Nursing. And the reason being the way I was helped by others emotionally, physically, and spiritually, I wanted to help the sick ones. Later on, I became a director of nurses in a geriatric center, the care of the elderly, because I wanted to give them all I could, what I couldn't do for my own parents or relatives. My survival can be attributed to the righteousness of the extraordinary Luchinsky family, acting upon the prevailing sense of humanity, putting their lives and those of their children at risk. Also, also due to my uncle Ben, who despite insurmountable odds, never gave up on his quest to save us. The past, the challenges, and the obstacles that I had to overcome made me a stronger and more tolerant individual. One who has faith and that there is a God who watches us all. I am fortunate now to have a bench at the Illinois Holocaust Museum dedicated in memory of my father, mother, and sister. Because my family was denied the dignity of a lasting gravesite, this bench serves as a place for me to visit and memorialize them. My blanket, I donated in 2006 to the Holocaust Museum. This blanket is my treasure, not gold, and not silver, but my link to my family who perished. It kept my tiny body warm and absorbed my tears as we ran through the forest. It never came off me. It was like a protective shield. I am the little girl who survived wrapped in this blanket and wish it to be displayed as evidence of my family's suffering from generation to generation. It was my daughter, Simona, who encouraged me to open up my deep-seated capsule of silence for 32 years and be strong enough to share my survival. And by the way, after 32 years, when I started sharing, my mouth doesn't shut up. <laughs> now, I have very special message to you, the young generation. First, I am very honored that you are all here to listen. You must remember that you are probably the last generation to be able to speak 
to a survivor of the Holocaust. Therefore, it is incumbent upon you to pass my tragic information and other survivors to other generation and future generation, as we say in Hebrew, to tell me door le door. Remember, the Holocaust did not start with the gas chambers, but with discrimination, verbal and physical bullying. So you must always make a commitment to take a stand with me to fight bullying and intolerance of any sort. Since you are the future leaders of the country, you must now start preventing the tragedies of loss of life from bullying in the innocent ones. By the way, bullying is not only in the young generation. You could encounter some of them also in adults. So everyone must take a stand. Remember to visit the Illinois Holocaust Museum in Skokie and encourage others to do so. The museum is dedicated in preserving the legacy of the Holocaust by honoring with dignity the memories of the sacred ones who perished in a world devoid of human rights. You must remember, as we all have a name, they all had a name. And it reminds all of us who survived that we have a special obligation to those who perished to make up for their unlived lives. I want you to remember to honor and respect your parents, grandparents, and friends the same way as you wanted to be respected. Be grateful that you live in a free country and be very thankful for what you have. Never compare to what others possess. Be also thankful for the gift of life.